Well, hello again. I'm not on the roof of the garage this time. I'm in my car headed south for an adventure. So it's time for a little ride along and talk. Uh, this is my car. I'm out for a weekend adventure and I am not doing the driving today. I have my hands near the steering wheel, but I haven't had to touch it so far. I've been on the road about 20 minutes and there's been no need to intervene. The car knows how to drive itself really well. This is a Tesla Model 3 and as long as I have my eyes on the road, I can keep my hands close to the steering wheel, but not on the steering wheel, and have it drive me wherever I need to go. And I've been testing this full self-driving software ever since it was first made available to the general public in October of 2021. So it's been about three years now, and it's been a really, really interesting um, experience to see how the software has developed and how computer vision has become more and more accurate and how it can decipher the world and make good choices up to and including driving a car. And so as you might imagine, uh, I was tuned in to watch the Tesla RoboTaxi event last night and I have some thoughts. Uh, the first thought, of course, is that none of it was very surprising. This is stuff that Tesla and their CEO have been talking about for many, many years. And uh, the biggest surprise was that they're actually following through on one of their earlier uh, stated goals from the Master Plan Part 2 of having a robo-bus, which is a larger vehicle able to handle more people. Uh, but of course the main story of the night last night was the robo taxi uh, The robo taxi turned out to be a small vehicle a two-seater uh, Which has no steering wheel no pedals just the screen in front and a Seat belt of course two seats and a big trunk in back The idea of course is that you don't necessarily need to own one of these cars you can call it to come to you and When you need a ride someplace it will take you there and then drop you off you don't need to worry about parking, you don't need to worry about vehicle ownership, you don't need to worry about maintenance, you don't need to worry about uh, registration and all of those other things. Uh, it really will become transportation as a service. And there are a lot of urbanists who are scared about this sort of thing, about how this will be just another way for people to um, uh, get uh, sink into the car culture and uh, it will be very bad for cities. But I have the opposite view. I'm really excited for robo taxis and for the robo bus, or as they talked about it, the robo van. And boy, it's going to have such a positive impact on our cities. Um, like any kind of technology, it will um, not necessarily fix things, but it will uh, empower people to make their choices that they already would have made. So there are going to be some people who choose to live farther away from town who choose to live in not just suburbs, but exurbs way far away. They'll get up really early in the morning and then uh, sleep on their way to work. And so it doesn't really matter how far away they are. And then in the afternoon, they'll leave early and, and sleep all the way home. And so uh, commutes can become even longer than they already are. If people are determined to have a house and a yard and a single family home way far away from the uh, urban core from their workplaces. but. As far as uh, city development, the implications are enormous. I'm sure you've all seen maps of cities that have uh, the uh, places colored in for humans, for parks, for, for working, uh, basically human areas where we can go, and then uh, the different color being for parking lots. And for places like Salt Lake City or other car dependent cities, the map is really very depressing. Uh, the parking areas almost always uh, are larger than the space given to to uh, human beings. I mean, just imagine your own, say, if you have a cubicle at work and it's maybe uh, 12 feet by 12 feet, so 144 square feet total. Whereas your car needs more space than that, not just for the parking spot, which is often you know 12 feet by 20 feet, uh, but there's also the parking aisles. If you have a parking garage, the ramps. It's always funny to me that the parking garages of uh, commu uh, commercial buildings or apartment buildings are often larger and the more expensive structure than the actual office building or apartment. So you can imagine how much better it's going to be for developers, but then also for apartment uh, renters if the cost of those parking garages is no longer needed. Uh, downtown we currently have parking minimum requirements. 
These are uh, buildings and developments, especially uh, apartments, where there's a minimum number of parking stalls required to build an apartment building. And that raises the cost for everyone. Even if you have no car, you are supposed to have, by, by, by ordinance, government ordinance, a spot for your non-existent car. So, uh, by, in a future where there are robo-taxis, you can imagine these parking minimums would be completely abolished. You wouldn't need to have them. Uh, you would have apartment buildings with no parking on site, and when you have your car that you want, uh, maybe it's at a special service garage, uh, someplace uh, not in the downtown urban core, you can summon it to you and it will be there within a matter of minutes. Uh, just as if you had a car in your garage and you have the presets to, you know, turn the air conditioning on before your car goes on. Do other people have that? Uh, I have that. Whenever I want to drive the car, I always think a few minutes in advance and turn the air conditioning on so that it's nice and cool, or, or the heater on whenever I, I want to defrost the car. It's been <laughs> many years since I've uh, scraped the windshield of my car. Uh, just let it defrost on its own. Um, it's also really important for cities in terms of uh, mode split. Right now, uh, in our car dependent culture, we have um, uh, the culture is dependent on cars mainly because cars are a product that people buy. It's not a service people use, like public transit, but it's an asset in your home, uh, maybe an investment that you've made. Uh, and having that change from being an ownership model to a service model is fundamental. Uh, because uh, a product that you own, especially an expensive car where you're making monthly payments on the car, uh, if you haven't paid it off yet, uh, it, it, it's, it adds up. So every month you're, you're paying for the car and you have a real disincentive to choose a different mode. Why would you pay for your car and then leave it in the garage and then pay for transit or, or, or something else? Um, why would you ride your bike if you have a car that you're paying for and let it sit in your garage? That's not just uh, crazy, that's just bad financial management. But what if instead you are uh, subscribed to a transportation service and this transportation service uh, would send you a car if that's what you need or it will buy a transit ticket for you or it will send uh, an e-scooter or e-bike to your house if that's the best way for you to go. It all depends on whatever pre-settings you have for your vehicle. Uh, that will make it so much easier to, instead of just, ah, I need to go somewhere, let's get in the car, it'll change to, okay, I'm going somewhere, I type that into my phone, into my app, and then it tells me what mode I need to use to get someplace. Uh, you can imagine that it'll be so much easier to have a robo-taxi pick someone up at their suburban home, say, if you're talking about a person in the suburbs, and that robo-taxi will take someone to a transit station, maybe a train station. And then you're not having to have uh, parking at these stations. We can get rid of park and rides, and we can build more transit-oriented development and still have both things. Now, it's a real tension in the urban community. Do you build a parking lot at your train station? Uh, there are so many people who, who live in these little cul-de-sac neighborhoods, and the only way in or out, that only way that these people think to get in and out of their homes, and, and for all practical purposes, you know, uh, they're probably right. Uh, they're more than a quarter mile away from uh, the entrance to their suburb division. So the only way to get to these houses or to get from these houses to the transit station is in a car. And so if you want these people to ride your train, you absolutely have to have a parking structure there at your train station so that people can get there. But at the same time, uh, parking is such a terrible land use. Like I was saying before, parking spots take up so much space, so much more space than humans do. Uh, and, and by building a parking lot instead of, you know, uh, apartments or office space or, or more dense development, you are extremely limiting how many people you can build or how many people you can access at that transit station. Uh, the, the, you put a hard cap at the utility of that transit station, which uh, is um, uh, not good long-term planning. But now if you don't need the parking lot, if you can have a taxi come and drop someone off at the train station, uh, they call that a kiss and ride in, in, the, in the business where you have a, a loop for pick up and drop off. Then suddenly you can eat your cake and have it too, where people will be able to drive to the transit station an unlimited number because the cars keep cycling through and you can use the space that used to be for a uh, parking lot and use that for apartments, use it for commercial space. You can have both things 
and it's the robo taxis and robotic or autonomy vehicle autonomy that will make that possible. But one of the things, like I said before, is that I'm most excited about is the Robovan, the robot bus. Uh, the most pushback I've got on any of my vehicle, or any of my videos so far, is the end of my uh, video about the Ogden Bus Rapid Transit, where I talk about how my predictions for buses are, are that um, they will be so much more useful and accessible to the general public when we can get rid of the human drivers. I have nothing against bus drivers. I took bus driver training. I have my UTA number from when I used to work there. Uh, I know many drivers and they're very good people. Uh, it's not anything personal. It's just that uh, if we want to have service that is up to modern standards, you know, the service of, say, an elevator, uh, we need to do what elevators did. Elevators used to have human operators that you'd talk to and they would uh, take, uh, drive the elevator to the right floor for you. And there was sometimes mistakes because, well, human errors where people um, don't line up the elevator just right to the right floor or even in some cases a crowded elevator someone might get caught in the doors or something uh, it was just bad and so uh, automatic oh and, and worse of course is that there were only certain hours that the elevators worked right if you weren't going to your department store during regular business hours and you were going uh, later at night the elevators wouldn't work there would be no one to drive them so the elevators had these big signs saying all, uh, hours of operation because you had to have them staffed with people. And this should all sound very familiar to transit planners, where uh, the frequency of a bus route and the hours of service are not determined by the buses. You know, the buses can run all day long. They're machines, they're happy to keep running. Uh, they're determined by the staffing, having the people available. And the human staffing is the most expensive part. You have the salary to pay for, you have the wages to pay for, uh, training, uh, insurance, all these things that add up when you have uh, these employees for the transit agency uh, roaming around out in public. Now, obviously, if sending robots out to roam around in public also requires, you know, cost and insurance and things. But if you can uh, have them operate more predictably and and, and regularly than a, than a human can, well, those will become lower too. But uh, the main thing here is that if you have each bus on its own able to operate itself then you don't need to make some of the other trade-offs. Uh, transit agencies of the past have operate, uh, have hired as few uh, operators as they can to keep expenses down. So you make your buses big so they can handle more people. Uh, the same thing, the same logic applies to trains. Op have as few operators as possible so you connect all your train cars together and make one long train and therefore the most expensive part, the operator, uh, can move more people per operator. That really is the financial logic behind a lot of the transit decisions. Uh, having passengers per operator ratio be as uh, high as possible. Uh, but when you have robotic vehicles, suddenly that switches the other way. Uh, the only way to get more people to ride is to have more service. So why not have a bus come by every two minutes? Uh, just like uh, a robo-taxi would, just have them roam around. Uh, you wouldn't have a big bus in that case, you'd have something smaller. Uh, Tesla showed off last night the 20-person uh, version that they want to make. It looks a lot more luxurious than you'd have for a regular uh, city bus. I, I think uh, they'd want to have more handholds and wheelchair accessibility on certain models, but not necessarily on all models. Uh, you, you can have a greater variety of things. You don't have to have standard designs anymore. Uh, some vehicles can be accessible to uh, ADA passengers and some, some don't need to be. You can go wild with it. Uh, but the idea is that you can have smaller vehicles uh, take smaller amounts of people uh, more directly to their destinations. If you have a bus that's 40 feet long, able to handle, uh, carry 60 people, well you have the potential to stop at every single station along the line. And uh, that slows things way down. Uh, and uh, you have to schedule your buses as if people were going to need to stop there every t at every single stop. Otherwise, the buses fall behind their schedule and you get bus bunching. So it's extremely annoying as a rider of UTA buses when you get to these stops that are checkpoints, right? And these are stops where the bus needs to uh, hit its schedule exactly. Well, what happens if the bus doesn't have as many people on board and the bus gets to the checkpoint early? Well, that doesn't make you. It doesn't mean you get to go home earlier. It just means that you get to wait at that checkpoint stop longer, because the bus will sit there and wait for its schedule to catch up with the bus, instead of this uh, bus to catch up with the schedule. Um, 
uh, and, and that can be very frustrating. So imagine these vehicles, these buses, we'll still call them buses, I, I imagine they'll be more van-sized, and uh, they would run uh, continuously, not on a schedule. You just know the route that here they are. Maybe they don't even follow a route. Maybe you can, with a few extra dollars, make them like a flex bus sort of thing. Well, they'll go out of your out of the way for a block or two to get you closer to your destination. Uh, like I said, it's going to be a very rich e ecosystem of, of all kinds of autonomous vehicles. But uh, you can imagine how uh, that would be a much more appealing service to get on a smaller vehicle shared with only a couple passengers where the potential for stopping is lower, where it's not on a schedule, where it just goes and it takes you to a stop that needs to be. And of course, with robo taxis being more of a thing um, and parking lots not being a thing anymore, then business has have an incentive not to spend on parking lots, but to spend on pickup and drop off areas, what we used to call bus stops. They'd want to have more areas out front for uh, for people to wait in, in, in shaded environments, uh, maybe uh, little numbers like an airport pickup, uh, you know, A1, A2, A3, where you can stand and say, this is where you to pick me up, RoboTaxi, at this particular waypoint. And one of them can be dedicated to buses and that sort of thing. The point of all this is that uh, the line between the line between transit and uh, ride sharing is going to become extremely blurry. It wouldn't surprise me at all if if UTA becomes more the operator of say paratransit, or or or, or maybe just BRT lines, and the whole idea or notion of a neighborhood bus uh, kind of fades away uh, because of the extra convenience offered by uh, these robotic services. Haha, <laughs> I'm just getting passed by the front runner. Uh, as you know, I've probably been stuck in, probably can see, I've been stuck in traffic for the last, oh, 10-ish minutes, and of course, no interventions here, the car is able to handle it just fine. But, back to transit, the uh, takeaway for this, and how this applies to the, the main uh, theme of my channel, the Rio Grande Plan, is that transit planners really are not looking ahead to this kind of robotic revolution. You can imagine how um, having parking lots removed from cities, and how having so much of traffic removed, uh, like all this traffic right now is caused by human error, essentially, error, operator error. Uh, robotic cars that are able to communicate with each other, they won't be able to, be, they, they won't be stuck in traffic jams as much. They will coordinate with each other. They can work out spacing. They can smooth out these traffic ripples. Traffic jams, essentially, are only going to be caused by overcapacity, whereas in the past, I can't think of a single traffic jam I've, I've ever heard of caused by overcapacity. Uh, the theoretical capacity of each lane has never been reached because human drivers just have, have too much variance between them and how they have their driving styles. You know, some drive more conservatively, some drive more aggressively. You know, I have my car right now set to drive aggressively, uh, so it does um, some California maneuvers that make me a little embarrassed as a, as a Utah driver. But uh, once you have more um, uniformity between drivers, uh, robotic drivers, of course, uh, traffic jams won't be as big of an issue. So you'll have these freeways that no longer get congested. Uh, transit's going to have to really step up its level of service in order to compete with freeways that no longer jam so regularly. I mean, obviously you'll have snowstorms, you'll have rainstorms, you'll have times when traffic is slower than usual. It won't be anything you can depend on. Uh, but it will still keep moving and will be faster than it is today. Transit's really going to have to step up to compete with this. We're going to have to have robotic trains that run just as frequently as the um, uh, robo-taxis are available. Uh, you know, right now, Trax runs every 15 minutes. If you go to a station and you've just missed your train, you have to wait 15 minutes. Uh, depending on the station, you know, two other trains will come past, but they aren't going where you need to go. Well, think about robot trains for a second. Think about if you have a three-car train and all three cars are going different places. So you look at the, uh, the, uh, the moniker on each different car to see where to go. Because well, each car has its own driving computer in it. it. They can split off and go different directions. You know, the tracks platforms downtown, they're made for four cars. I imagine autonomous front-runner trains will probably get, or autonomous tracks trains will probably get a little smaller. You don't need to have a full 70-foot-long light rail vehicle made for 100 passengers every every two minutes uh, going to each destination you could probably make them you know 40 or 50 feet long like a streetcar sort of thing a single unit and and have them combine into trains uh, much longer 
but the idea is that at, at, at using that sort of um, robotic uh, uh, transit driver, uh, you can have uh, major improvements uh, achieved through uh, on the light rail system too. You can have uh, a two-minute frequency to to any destination. Just be very careful which car you get into. Uh, front runner, they wanted to do uh, double tracking, of course, but with double tracking, you're also able to do express trains, trains that skip a stop because. Well, each car on the frontrunner train, uh, or intercity train, whatever it is, the commuter train, uh, that's autonomous too. So as long as the headways are large enough, you can have the first car not stop at the station. Uh, the next station just goes right through and stops only the most important ones uh, and have achieve a higher service. But whenever I bring this up to transit planners, uh, I always get strange looks because this stuff sounds like you know pie in the sky in the future, and, and it kind of is, but at the same time, Look at me right now. I still have not touched the steering wheel in as long as this video has gone on. It's 20 minutes already? Man. The, 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 obviously reliability needs to come up to a 99.999% whatever, but I, I, I've been testing this tech for so long. I've, I've been living in this sort of future where the car will find you in the parking lot. You don't need to go to it. And it just seems so so clear and obvious to me that uh, an amazing transportation revolution, the biggest thing since since cars first got on the on the road, since the biggest thing since the interstate freeway system, you know, 60 years ago, it's going to absolutely upend all kinds of planning that we've done. And if we aren't careful in the way that we uh, approach this, then we won't be able to um, realize all the all the all the gains. Uh, so uh, once again, the Rio Grande Depot is the best building, the best location for a train station in downtown Salt Lake City. This is going to be uh, a uh, very fundamental step for Salt Lake City to take. Uh, we have the uh, future bifurcating ahead of us, uh, where we can choose um, robotic vehicles without tracks that you know are slightly less efficient. They can be as convenient as as a walkable neighborhood. Uh, they, they will be in some ways more convenient than transit in certain uh, um, uh, uh, lifestyles. But if we want to have a strong, cohesive downtown, if we want our capital city to be a capital city, we need to start building the infrastructure so that we can run a convenient transit service, something that can compete with the wave of robotic vehicles that are about to come. Uh, if we don't have the infrastructure in place, uh, the, the impetus for building it is going to, uh, in worst case scenario, the impetus is going to be diminished as people realize or, 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 or think they're realizing that they can solve their problems with autonomous cars. I, I don't think autonomous cars are going to solve all problems. They're going to make life a lot better. Like, I'm stuck in this traffic jam now. It's definitely going to make my life better right at this moment when uh, everyone can have their own autonomous car. But uh, it's going to make transit so much more convenient too, but you have to have the vision for it. You have to be able to see ahead that, oh, transit can become so much better than it is now. And that's been the problem so far in planning for, for Utah and, and for most places in the United States where you know, government planning for, for train service has been maintain the level of service that was existing. UTA is a bit of an exception in that um, uh, they've had to rebuild a lot of things, but a lot of the same assumptions that we had of, say, the Bamberger interurban lines, uh, which uh, are basically replaced by modern-day Frontrunner, uh, you can look at those kind of tables or, or, or where to put stations based on existing sidings of where the old stations used to be, and you can see that Frontrunner is very much an iteration from the past. Uh, all these government agencies that inherited their transit systems, they, they've had the same sort of problem where their, their main goal is just maintain service. They don't need to worry about expanding it. They don't need to worry about making it a better product, a better service for people. Uh, just maintain what they had when it was given to them uh, uh, in the 80s or 90s or, or however long it's been since uh, 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 transit service was privatized. So uh, I, I hope the event last night uh, was a wake-up call. If not, uh, hopefully seeing more and more autonomous vehicles on the road, either from Tesla or from Waymo or from other companies that are working on this problem, hopefully that will be the wake-up call to get people um, inspired as to 
not what just robotic vehicles can do, but also robotic transit vehicles, robotic trains. Uh, the revolution really will take a lot of people by surprise, but um, if you've watched this video, maybe you know it's coming um, and, and can help uh, prepare for it. Anyway, that's long enough. Uh, I'll stay here on the road watching the taillights on my way south, and uh, maybe one day in the future, I won't need to watch those. I'm Christian Linhart. Thanks for watching.